Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Starcheski. I direct the Oral History Master of Arts program um, here at Columbia and I'm gonna get us started tonight. Um, we did want to open with a uh, land acknowledgement and land acknowledgements, you know, as we all know, are complicated in these digital spaces that we're now meeting in all the time. Um, I want to start by recognizing that uh, those of us working here at Columbia and in the New York area are based on the unceded land of the Lenape people um, from which they were violently dispossessed. Um, and we honor the strength and resilience it's taken for them to resist and rebuild both here and in the diaspora. Uh, if you wanna support Lenape people's work, you can support through the Lenape Center or the Manahata Fund. And we're gonna put links for both of those in the chat. As oral historians, um, we also have a particular acknowledgement to make. This isn't just about land, it's about culture. Um, and so we find it really important to acknowledge the particular colonial history of our field. Um, oral history as an academic research methodology has thrived and built power um, only through appropriating indigenous uh, oral history practices at the same time as the field has marginalized and delegitimized these practices as just oral tradition um, that don't get to count as historical sources that don't get to be part of oral history archives. Um, you can read more about this particular history in Maori scholar Napia Mahuika's work, and um, we're going to drop that link in the chat as well. Um, really excellent work, book on oral uh, history and oral traditions. We know that Indigenous oral history practices are really the foundation for everything we do. This event is part of that process, um, it's a small part. It began as part of OMA's year-long uh, regular Thursday evening public programming series, um, although it's become much more than that. Uh, this year, our theme is relating oral history. So we're looking at oral history as a process that happens through relationships and also looking at what it means to relate a story that we've heard to another person, especially to retell a story sort of personally with our bodies, with our mouths. Um, and so we, honestly, Tommy Orange has been on our, our sort of wish list of speakers for a long time. As soon as I read they're there, I just was, I knew that this is a person that I would be lucky and honored to learn from. Um, I, you know, I wanted to know what inspired him to add Dean Oxendine as a character. What, what does he think about story core, about storytelling? Um, you know, what's, what's behind this, this angle of the story? Um, and as I began seeking co-sponsors for this event, it became very quickly clear that I was not the only person who was dying to have this conversation. Um, I'm especially grateful to Audra Simpson and Michael Whitgen who organized this event with me, as well as all of our co-sponsors. And I'll read them out now. Um, and just notice how, how broad this interest is. Uh, the Department of Anthropology, the Work Inside and Outside the University Initiative, Native Americans at Columbia, which is a student group Department of English and Comparative Literature, Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, the Society of Fellows and Heyman Center for the Humanities, which is our public humanities center, the Office of the Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement, the Writing Program at the Columbia School of the Arts, the Oral History Master of Arts Program, and the Oral History Association. Well, I'm gonna now um, hand it over to the interlocutors for our conversation this evening, uh, Michael Wittgen and Audra Simpson. I'll give you a little quick bio. Uh, Michael Wittgen is a professor in the Department of History and the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia University. He's a citizen of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. He specializes in indigenous and early North American history, comparative borderlands, and the history of the early American Republic. Audra Simpson is a political anthropologist whose work is focused on contextualizing the force and consequences of governance through time, space, and bodies. Her research and writing is rooted within indigenous polities in the US and Canada and crosses the fields of anthropology, indigenous studies, American and Canadian studies, gender and sexuality studies, as well as politics. Um, and actually all three of our classes, Audra's class, Michael's class, and my class, just read there there in the last uh, couple of weeks and we discussed it together in a little call before this. So it's really exciting to see the kind of interdisciplinary conversations we can be having around this work. Uh, so Michael and Audra, I'll turn it over to you. Um, thank you so much. Michael and I um, have, um, I wish we could say we crafted this ourselves, but we have a brief bio that we'd like to um, read um, of 
Tommy Orange, for those who do not know of his many accomplishments. Michael, I, shall I read this? Is this sure, okay absolutely. with you, Michael? Yep. Okay, awesome. So um, we'd like to say first things first in introducing Tommy Orange, he's a great writer. <laughs> um, Tommy Orange's book, There There, um, is a national bestseller that won the Penn Hemingway Award, the National Book Circle, Book Critics Circle John Leonard Prize, the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize, and the American Book Award. It was also shortlisted for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, and was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Mm. It appeared on countless best books of the year list, including those of the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, Time, O or Oprah Magazine, GQ, Entertainment Weekly, and BuzzFeed. In his 2017 opinion piece in the Los Angeles Times entitled, Thanksgiving is a tradition, period, it's also a lie. He confronted the violent past of the American holiday, asking readers to challenge their traditions. He is a 2014 McDowell Fellow and a 2016 Writing by Writers Fellow, as well as a graduate from the MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts, IAIA which will be familiar to everyone in Native Studies. Tommy Orange is an enrolled member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma and was born and raised in Oakland, California. He now lives in Angels Camp, California with his wife and son. This is um, a way of introducing him. And we'd like to say Michael and I as indigenous professors here at Columbia that were Tommy to be here with Amy, we would have given him a blanket, we would have gifted him, we would have shared food with him. Our students and our friends and our colleagues from all throughout New York City would have come to join in this celebration. What we have for you, a celebration of this conversation, the gift we have for you, Tommy, right now is our it's high level gratitude and we blanket you with that. Um, Michael, would you like to add to this. Uh, no, we're <clears throat> just thrilled that you could be here and kind of engage with us about this book, but also the themes that you engage in the book with indigenous history, uh, representation, identity. Um, and I think it's kind of an interesting time that we've now got two TV shows after you know years of no representation uh, in, in TV, but still missing from that are uh, sh representation from where most Native people live, which is not on reservation, but in urban and suburban spaces, which is very much center and front and center in your novel. So we're really excited to uh, engage with that. Um, and I think with that, we're going to start out with a reading, right? Um, sure. Yeah. Thank you, Audrey and Michael. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, I've never had, um, I've never done a, a speaking event that, that was so focused. Um, and in a, in a way that really is at the heart of, of what the book was born out of, which was, you know, digital storytelling and thinking about storytelling in the community. Um, the book never would have been made had I not experienced what I experienced working in the community in Oakland. Um, so I'm going to read from Dean Oxendine, who is a character in the in the novel who's doing a storytelling project. Um, I should say there there is an autobiographical element to Dean Oxendine. Um, I I did get funded by the city of Oakland for two years to do a storytelling project, and they did not know that it was all fiction, um, and. I might have been in a scandal for embezzlement or something, but the, I ended up having lunch with the person who was cutting my checks and um, she very much became a fan of the book. And I had lunch with the mayor of Oakland and was absolved of, of only having done the project in fictional form. Uh, when I pitched the idea and, and when, the, when, the, when I was funded by the city of Oakland, I had wanted to do a storytelling project. Um, but the fiction took over. So this is from the, a chapter in the interlude uh, 
and like all of the chapters, it's just named after the, the name of the character, Dean Oxendine. Dean convinced Blue to let Calvin do his interview for the storytelling project during work hours. Calvin keeps crossing and uncrossing his legs and pulling at his hat by the bill. Dean thinks Calvin is nervous, but then Dean is nervous. He's always nervous, so maybe it's just projection. But projection as a concept is a slippery slope because everything could be projection. He is regularly subject to, to solipsism's recursive drowning effect. He set up the camera in Mike and Blue's office beforehand. Blue's on her lunch hour. Calvin is sitting still now, staring at Dean, mess with the recording equipment. Dean figures out what was wrong and hits record on the camera and on the recording device then adjusts the mic one last time. Dean learned early on to record everything before and after as those moments can sometimes be even better than when the interviewee knows they're being recorded. Sorry, I thought we were good to go before you came in, Dean says and sits down to the right of the camera. It's cool, Calvin says. What is this again? You're gonna say your name and tribe, talk about the place or places you've lived in Oakland. And then if you can think of a story to tell like something that's happened to you in Oakland, that might like give a picture of what it's been like for you specifically growing up in Oakland as a native person, what it's been like. My dad never talked about being native and shit to the point that we don't even know what tribe we are on his side. Our mom has native blood on her Mexican side too. But she doesn't know too much about that either. Yeah, my dad wasn't home hardly ever. Then one day he was really gone. He left us. So I don't know. I feel bad sometimes even saying I'm native. Mostly I just feel like I'm from Oakland. Oh, Dean says. I got robbed in the parking lot about to go to a powwow at Laney College. It's not really a good story. I just got fucking robbed in a parking lot and then I left. I never made it to the powwow. So this one coming up will be my first one. Dean isn't sure how to help him get to a story and he doesn't want to force it. He's glad he's already been recording. Sometimes not having a story is the story. It's like having him as a dad not knowing and how he fucked us up as a dad. I don't wanna come off like I think that's what being native means. I know there's a lot of natives living in Oakland and in the Bay Area with similar stories. But it's like we can't talk about it because it's not really a native story. But then it is at the same time. It's fucked up. Yeah. When are you going to start recording for me to say like whatever I'm going to try to say? Oh, I've already been recording. What? Sorry, I should have told you. Does that mean you're going to use anything I've already said? Can I? I mean... I guess, is this shit like your job? Kind of, I don't have another job, but I'm trying to pay all the participants out of the grant money I got from the city of Oakland. I think I'll make enough to get by, Dean says. And then there's a lull, a silence neither one of them knows how to recover from. Dean clears his throat. How'd you end up working here, Dean says. My sister, she's friends with Blue. So you don't feel like any kind of native pride or whatever? Honestly, yeah. I just don't feel right trying to say something that doesn't feel true. That's what I'm trying to get out of this whole thing. I'll put together all our stories because all we got right now are reservation stories and shitty versions from outdated history books. A lot of us live in cities now. This is just supposed to be like a way to start telling this other story. I just don't think it's right for me to claim being native if I don't know anything about it. So you think being native is about knowing something? No, but it's about a culture and a history. My dad wasn't around either. I don't even know who he is. My mom's native too though. And she taught me what she could when she wasn't too busy working or just not in the mood. The way she said it, our ancestors all fought to stay alive. So some parts of their blood went together with another nation's blood and they made children. So forget them, forget them, even as they live on in us. 
And I feel you, but then again, I don't know. I just don't know about this blood shit. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks so much, Tommy. Um, Michael, should I start? Do you want me to start, Michael? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I think that's an okay. Um, uh, Tommy, thanks so much for that. That was a really perfect way to start things out as we're really, we're the three of us, you know, teaching your book for different reasons, aside from, you know, it's a great book. Everybody was reading it. Everybody is reading it. Um, for me and for um, the kind of cultural analysis that I'm interested in, and your book speaks directly to this problem, this ongoing problem of the, it seems targeted at times. And it's so interesting that you start the book out with a, refle a targeted reflection that everybody saw of an Indian head in their home. But the targeted disappearance of indigenous peoples from the American consciousness, from a kind of ethos or sense of you know, responsibility, and the simultaneous struggle of your characters to, to stay alive, to stay in possession of their stories, to remember stories, to tell each other stories, to keep secrets. The story within your story is not just about survival, it's about truth, it's about, um, it's it's a much deeper it's a much deeper thing I think than you know as as we heard with Amy you know the idea of oral history is like oh there are these quaint stories your your folks these people in this book are are struggling to to have a kind of truth that's valuable and is recognizable to each other and to the world outside but at the same time are also swimming upstream against this expectation that they be perfect cultural beings, that they know everything about their culture, that they are perfect traditional people, that they're proud, as we saw in this interview, with this subject. This is why it's so great that you started this way, the absolutely imperfect indigenous subject who's like, I don't know if I have what you want, you know? Um, so I just wanted to invite you to tell us more about that, the, the value, I mean, at one point, one of your characters, this incredible opal as a little girl, wields a, a wooden baseball bat to protect her sister, and on the baseball bat is story. And I, I couldn't help but think that you were <clears throat> signaling to us that these stories, for better or for worse, are also going to protect each other. Um, so I just wanted to invite you to tell us more about the idea of story and, and history. I think Michael might ask you about that too, capital H history if you want, or whichever way you want to, direction you want to take it in. Thank you, Audrey. That was a, a very generous and expansive question. Um, You know, I, I I think when I wrote the book, because um, I'm, I'm right, I'm finishing another book right now. When I wrote the book, I was really coming from the perspective of having worked in the community and and done storytelling work with the community, and thinking about a lot of these ideas about identity and this impossible standard, uh, and like you pointed out, the 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 headdress native, the impossible standard that everyone sort of falling asleep to as this TV runs out. Um, and the idea like is, is so persistent in so many people's minds of like what the real Indian looks like and what the real Indian does not look like. And, and this is a part of erasure and, and story and narrative is such a big part of our erasure and the, and, and, and the need for, for this country to, to have a clean, origin story to have a clean um creation story that that has to do with with the pilgrims and you know everyone knows how stupid it is but it still is taught in schools 
now, like these days still is taught in school. Um, and so at the time, you know, I was really trying to write from this frustration of feeling like uh, people that I knew in Oakland and, and even myself, you know, I have a white parent and a native parent and uh, Oakland is super diverse and, and uh, it was not abnormal to, to, to be somebody like me but but I also went to schools where where uh, I was the only native kid or me and, me and my sisters were the only native kids um, this impossible standard piece I only came to it in writing the second book to understand like oh we don't need to be sorry for something that was like absolutely designed for our erasure and for American brainwashing like the cultural genocide that happened at boarding schools and the, and the, the film depiction um, and the way that we've been depicted had to do with keeping us as the vanishing race, frozen in time as vanishing. So no wonder we froze in time as the head dressed, you know, impossible image to meet the standard of, because it was designed that we should not ever be real outside of that image. Um, and so, you know, I, I, the book was so informed by, by doing this storytelling work, not only in the Native community, but in a lot of other um, communities that, that tend to be marginalized and, and invisible and don't get their stories told but through a, a nonprofit out of Berkeley um, called Story Center, it used to be called the Center for Digital Storytelling, um, but also did the work at the Native American Health Center in Oakland and um, and so, you know, coming to people whose stories in modern depiction, in what they see reflected in popular culture as not being there, them feeling like, well, I don't know what, I'm not, I'm not one of the people that has a story to tell, you know, because part of feeling like you can tell your story has to do with seeing your story told elsewhere. And, and you know, invisibility begets invisibility. And, um, and so like really working with people, like actually working with people in three-day workshop formats and, and getting them to tell their own stories. We would, we would teach them to write 300 word scripts and then we would teach them the digital video editing software. Sometimes even elders who barely touched computers at all um, were learning how to not only tell their stories, write their stories, record their voiceovers, but then like think about visually how you can, how it could be represented in, a, in like a two to three minute film that is, that would, you know, that the community could see and experience in this, in this modern way that we experience stories. I mean, we, we spend most of our time on screens this is just a fact. And, and some of that is experiencing stories. And like you said, uh, Michael said at the outset here, um, we just got TV shows for the first time in 2021. And these are modern native stories being told in ways that will empower people to feel like, oh yeah, like I can be a part of this collective American thing because now I'm seeing it. And, and people, I don't think people fully understand how devastating it is to grow up and never see your story reflected in, in popular culture in any way that feels relevant to you. That's only this impossible image that you'll never meet the standard of that is, that is actually meant to erase you. You know, you open <clears throat> the, the, this whole conversation reminds me of <clears throat> how you open the book with Tony. You know, speaking of representation and seeing yourself, the, oh, the book opens with him seeing himself for the first time, <clears throat> not in a mirror, but through a TV set. And I thought that was really kind of highly evocative that he's seeing an image of himself on a TV set, not projected to the TV, but reflected on the TV. And it's the first time he confronts his disability and sees his disability. And it's it, it was really evocative to me in terms of these issues that you're talking about. Um, and <clears throat> building off that, I, I kind of want to ask you another question that kind of combines craft and content, you know, kind of sticking with Tony, the character, there's a point on the book where he also is on the, he's on a, a, a bus or a subway, but he's got his power regalia on and he sees somebody looking at him and he says to himself, people always want to see the pretty history. And this is, you know, right before he goes, 
to a scene of pretty epic violence. Um, and it made me think a lot about the juxtaposition of these things, the pretty history and how you represent the history that isn't so pretty. Because I uh, am teaching this uh, survey of history class and we talked about this before, you know, that I, again, am coming to our discussion shortly after I've taught um, the Sand Creek Massacre and Washita and Wounded Knee, which for me is a really tough part in the semester. You know, I like the pretty history uh, early on when native people are still demographically the majority uh, and they're really empowered and it's possible to really help students see the future that native people could see for themselves still then and then you hit this bleak period in the 19th century where that history is is hard uh, and it's not really pretty and i was really struck uh, every time i've read your book by the way that you've sort of chosen to use this theme of violence and not just violence but gun violence um and the way it kind of your book culminates that if you could talk about the choices that you're making, how you're connecting this to a sense of history uh, and a sense of you know the story of Native people in North America. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just thinking the other day, um, like we uh, so sometimes you know thinking about Native history and and the, the bleakness, and I was thinking about the Washita massacre specifically. I'm like. Man, our our history is so bleak. We have like B-side massacres that people don't know about. <laughs> you have to like dig deep within to to understand it. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, the gun thing, like it's so it's so prevalent now. Like a lot of the things I used to get the question like. Um, and I think a lot of us have experienced this idea of like, um, well, it was pretty bad and we didn't do that. And we're starting to move past that sort of like um, attempt at absolving blame that, that white people used to have and Americans used to, the way that they used to think about history. But I was just recently, I met with a, it was at a private high school and I, I feel like I got a new form of the question that was like, that was sort of aimed at the same thing, which was still absolving or, or this idea that we aren't still affected by history. And it was, the question was reframed as like, can you give me some examples of how people are still affected by, by history? And it was like trying to skirt the idea that like, well, that happened a long time ago. Give me, give me something real that I can, that I can hear that makes sense, uh, so that, so that all of the things that I hear that are negative or, or the way that you all suffer, give me some proof that you have a reason to be in this category, as opposed to like we're not just equal and and blank slate and starting from the same pole. Myself up from the boots, my, my our bootstraps and you all just are weaker. Like, I mean, this is, sounds harsh and, you know, I'm sure this high school student didn't mean it in this way, but but this is always what it's been in, in terms of what happened. And gun violence is at the heart of American identity, obviously now. I mean, we're, we're, we're in some ways worse off than we ever were in terms of our identity with the gun as Americans, we're, we're moving into 2024 and um, school shootings still happening all the time and we're, we're numb to it. And it's so tied up with native history and with the way America was able to become a country and the way that the colonization worked with the gun. Um, it just seems so clear to me and to have to have the, the sort of 3D printed guns and, and to have this really contemporary story be resisting so much of the historical piece. Everything I was trying to do in the book was to have history feel like now and not have them be so separated. And so like, we need proof that that you, you all are still feeling it. Like we need some proof because I didn't do any of this. This is my ancestors. Like I was born, you know, in 19, 99 and and uh i've worked hard and you all just need to get over it and this sentimentality it sounds harsh or whatever 
but people still have this sense like like we need to get over history and story and and i appreciate what you called out roger about you know the bat being named story this was actually a, a bat that we inherited with our house in west oakland there was a wooden bat that was just left there and uh the name on the on the butt end of it was story with an e it was s-t-o-r-e-y and i just loved that so much that this bat could be named story and it worked in the, in the metaphorical sense that you named but we actually still have a bat i'm looking at it right now in the corner next to the door uh, named story um but that that the truth and telling stories and understanding the way the layers of history lay across time there's not a separation and there's not something that you can just like we're all going to start from you know it's it's very easy to understand somebody inheriting a ton of wealth and 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 power and and, and sort of like ending up in these different positions it's easier to to understand the material wealth being inherited within families it's much harder for people to understand the way pain gets distributed through lives across generations and over time. Yeah, I definitely was thinking about in the way everybody arrives with their own internalized violence and the way it erupts in the sort of massacre moment and, and the linkage between that massacre and past events. I definitely was thinking of this in terms of, you know, this is a, a feature, not a bug in North American history and indigenous experience in North America. So I definitely was thinking about it in that, that context, that connection between past and present. I'm really, I like that idea, Michael, of the feature and not a bug, that this is something systemic and maybe somewhat systematic. And I'm wondering, Tommy, where you see, I, I have to say the way, I just want to bracket for a moment. I don't know if anybody caught that Dexter is now dealing with thematics of murdered and missing indigenous women, right? This, this mainstream showtime, I think it's on. You know, Dexter is is adjacent to the Seneca Nation. He's got a presumably Seneca. She played the, the character is Seneca, police chief girlfriend, and you know his um, uh, his own thirst for blood and justice is ignited by various forms of criminality that he has to address there. Um, so there is a kind of anyway. So that's just bracketing, but adjacent to my next question for Tommy, which is about systemic violence, but also about the gendered systemic violence that is a part of um, settler colonialism or the crafting of, of a nation state that um, disavows its, its relationship to land and territory as theft. Um, and, and targets indigenous women in particular ways. I was really taken by the way you wrote women. Um, you have women that are really nicely fleshed out characters. You have women that are violent. You have women that are loving. You have you know all of this range, but you're also dealing at times, I think, with this kind of the bug of gender violence that is directed towards these women and women who are like adopted out a white family, goes to reconnect to her people and like she's got a man who wants to beat her up, right? And has to run away. And so she cannot escape, you know, even, even through this sort of out, you know, her own, uh, she can't escape it. Like one cannot escape this, the bug in the system. And I wanted to ask you about that, just about the gender, you know, where you see gender or, um, you know, are, are women or are, are, you know, gender variant folks, like how you see them caught up in this, if this is indeed part of the story of how this land gets taken and kept. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think um, it's no, I mean, it's, it's a joke at this point um, or it's a punchline um, that my grand, my great grandmother was a Cherokee princess. Whatever, whatever form of the joke or punchline, we've all heard it at this point. But I think the truth in the joke, you know, because there's always that, is that it's a grandmother. You don't hear a lot of white people going around saying, "My great grandfather 
um, it, when they're referencing their heritage. And this has to do with the way that Native women were taken and were raped and, and the positions that they found themselves in were compromised, to say the least. Um, so I think, you know, I mean, America is so deeply misogynistic and violent to its women. Um, and so th that's just, th that's actually a global thing. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of these things that just, you know, we're, we're, we're about to see Roe versus Wade overturned and, and um, you know, our relationship to women is just so awful and toxic and out of balance. Um, and so that's, you know, that's just the same for Native women. I, I chose to write uh, Native women in the book the way that I did because I, I've been influenced by strong Native women in my life and by women in my life in general. And there are strong Native leader women in Oakland um, like three of the biggest organizations in Oakland are led by women, their directors are women. Um, and, and so that was, you know, that was behind the decision to have, but it was also like, you know, wherever, so that's like what's informing where I'm coming from, but then like, you know, as in fiction, uh, these people just appear and, and, um, I, because I, I did this work in storytelling and, and really hearing people's stories um, and helping them to get their stories out and understanding the the earned experience of pain uh, as it relates to people's personal stories. I'd never, I would never use people's real stories in a fictional uh, context and I didn't, um, but I, but there was a, you know, definitely a composite influence from from my experience in the community and, and from my life experience that has to do with representing women in this way and um, wanting to address these things that have to do with women being strong in, in our communities, like grandmothers or like a, grandmothers mothers and aunties are like a really strong presence for, for a lot of families and men, and men, you know, haven't done as well. Uh, and this was just part of what was influencing the, wherever the characters came from when I went to, you know, take on the, the project of the novel over, over these years of time. Can I ask you a crafty question about your writing and your characters? If you yes. don't mind, did they, did they come to you at times? Did you keep a journal? Like as you were, you know, I know we had the benefit of talking to you before and you talked a little bit about, you know, becoming a writer, not thinking you would become a writer, not, you know, having read a lot during grad school, you were going to do music. And I'm wondering how these characters came to you. Did they see you? Did you start keeping a journal? Like, what was that process for you? There's something as an anthropologist that's really ethnographic about your work. Like, you pay attention to conversations. I love when Blue was in the car with her friend and she referred to her brother as this fuck. Like, it was so familiar and vernacular like this is how you talk about this total messed up dude in the back seat like it was like so real <laughs> so I'm like this guy really it was it seems beyond just an interview like you're paying attention to the world and to conversations around you and I was curious about how that you know formed into a book um sorry I'm hearing something It's gone now. I was singing. Can you ask again? It just, it sort of threw me. Um, not the second part about the conversation in the car with, with Blue and her friend, Geraldine. Um, the, right before that. Did, did, My, did everyone not hear that singing? It was a duet. I, just, I heard the singing. The singing was, the singing was interesting. <laughs> The singing happened. You are not imagining it, Tommy. We all heard it. Um, it was real. We're hearing it was real. Um, the, my question was about when these characters come to you and how right, they came right. to you right. and your process. And were you, is it like you're listening? All, you sound like an ethnographer at times to me, like a really good anthropologist. So I was curious. So, you know, I think um, the, the storytelling work that I did definitely influenced the way I thought about writing and wanting to, you know, get it out the way that it happens. But 
the first year of writing the book, uh, I was a brand new father. I was working full time and um, I was getting up at like five or six in the morning and would write before going to work. And almost all the characters, the major characters um, came out during that first year. And, you know, I would wake up one morning and, and a new voice would come or, or the momentum of the voice from the morning before I would work on it to, to develop it um, and keep listening to it. And, and so th they would come in the sense that writing comes anytime you're sitting down and your fingers start doing this and, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to get woo woo, but like, writing is a pretty mystical endeavor like nobody is choosing each word at a time as they come out like that's psychopathic if anyone's doing that that sounds wrong like you're letting your fingers sort of like try to get a thing out from your mind and so whatever that comes from that certainly was happening in these mornings when I first started writing the book now revisions a whole like another element and I think a lot of my experience in doing storytelling and in listening to people talk and tell their stories in the way that it comes out naturally before they go to their script and start trying to write it like we would have storytelling circles and you hear people just tell it like it is like tell it like like they would tell anyone like the way that we are natural storytellers like we we can we can throw out lines that just come from that same place in this really amazing way uh, as narrative crafters, like that, that's what our mind does. Um, and I think I was definitely listening to that and when it came to revision and, and wanting to make the characters feel real and, and, and to, to feel like even within this fictional context that storytelling was happening and that things were feeling real in that way, the revision process definitely aided from my experience. So, you know, it was both like, from the mystical place of like just writing and where that comes from, but like, you know, composite influence of storytelling work with, and, and listening to people a lot was definitely a big influence too. So a, a follow-up kind of crafty question um, related to this, you know, you know as a historian, I'm, I'm working with text all the time to generate the sort of stories that I'm telling, um, but I'm also reading quite a bit. And so I guess I, my question is, do you have any kind of reading strategies? I don't know if you're, you know, some of the, you touch on historical moments, you got everything from King Philip to the occupation of Alcatraz. Do you read history? Do you read um, fiction stuff? I have to read other history for my work, but when I'm writing, especially, I like to read, get heavy into fiction writing. So just things to help me think about the craft of narrative, craft of writing. So I don't know if you tap into any of that kind of thing or. I do. I do. I, I am, uh, I'm, constantly listening to books I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks but I also read you know I, I read text because uh, I think it's important to keep I think sometimes I think I enjoy listening to audiobooks more but the but it's important to keep my eyes sharp for reading text when it comes to the revision process if I'm not doing if I'm not staying engaged with text for my eyes uh, something goes wrong so I, I do try to do both um, but and I and I do read a ton of history um, you know I'll, and I'll, I'll sort of cherry pick when it comes to like unless the nonfiction writer is like amazing um, which um, I you know sometimes I'm not that impressed with nonfiction history books uh, in terms of like voice and the sentence level so I'll sort of cherry pick for you know I'll tell my brain to listen in for things that might be relevant and I'll do other things and uh, I'll be running or, um, but, but I'll it'll sort of be three quarters listening. And uh, so, you know, I'll listen to podcasts. I'll listen to nonfiction books. I read a whole book on, on, um, on it's something, uh, uh, the dreams of the shadow catcher. I believe it's, it's on, um, um, Edward Curtis, the photographer, the, the Indian photographer. Um, there's a whole book and, you know, it's, it was, it was pretty well written. Uh, and I, I think it's like three pages in the new book that I'm writing that I, that I'm using for the book. And I read this whole nonfiction book. So I definitely like, I'm doing that. Um, and, and Edward Curtis, like, like 
I think is super interesting to think about because he was so invested in capturing the vanishing race, which he claimed was from Geronimo's mouth. Geronimo was supposedly the one who called it the vanishing race, but he was the one invested in to the point that there was a picture of the, of the Pagan or Pagan, I'm not sure how to say the tribe, but there was a, there was a picture of them in, in a teepee. Uh, there was two, of, two men in a teepee. And there was a modern looking at the time clock between them. And he had the thing, obviously there's no airbrushing at the time, but whatever elements of editing they could do with photography at the time, he had the thing edited out he was so invested in the idea that he could capture what we once were because we were going to be gone that he didn't even want a clock there. Um, so, you know, I, I read this whole Edward Curtis thing because I'm, I'm thinking about depiction and, and what that's done to it, what damage that has done to us. So like when the, when the, when the, when the real violence in the Indian wars ended, what cold war took place and this is like the boarding schools and this is like film and photography depiction and this is the national narrative that gets propagated and this is sitting down for thanksgiving dinner and teaching in schools about what what happened um these are all the ways that we continue to be erased and, and the story continues to be um aimed against us in ways that that cause it more more erasure and more uh, you know sanitizing of history we have um, four more minutes with you, Michael and I. Michael, can I have that a little bit of the time, the last four? Or Absolutely. Just to ask, Michael, is it okay? Do you yep. consent, Michael? Okay, forget that. I'm frozen. Okay, awesome. Tommy, can we ask you about your next project? Um, and its relationship to there there. We know that you're in the you're in the final moments with your next book. And so we'd like to know about that. And then I personally would like to know what you're reading and what's on what's on your playlist, but you don't have to answer that. <laughs> we we really want to know about the next project, as does Michael's dog, Seamus. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm obsessively turning in a, a next draft in a week. And um, I have been writing it since before there there came out. Um, this thing started coming and, and and I knew it was the next book after they're there and in, in the same world as they're there. And um, I'm avoiding the word sequel because um, sometimes in the literary world, it feels like kind of like a beneath them thing, even though I don't have any shame about it. And um, we, we all love sequels um, in terms of like, obviously like with the Marvel universe being everything now sequels are like legitimately loved in major ways but um something different happens in the literary world where they want you to write another book that's related but don't but you don't have to have read the first one these are like editorial notes that i'm afraid of um anyway it's it, i sold it right before the pandemic it's it's it takes place Part of the book takes place after what happens at the end of there there and the other part of it takes place um, in history and this actually came from um, being uh, in Sweden at a museum getting this really bizarre um, sort of meta tour of a museum and and maybe some of you have experienced this at this point because we're at an interesting point with museum curators where they're starting to feel guilt for the whole endeavor of museums being like this theft project that's put in glass and institutionalized and made seem like this is for education and and you know we we came by all of these things by natural or you know good means um but now it feels like there's some so i was getting this tour of like we know this is like we shouldn't have these but we have them so you want to see them and uh i was in one of these museums in sweden getting this weird meta tour and there was a newspaper printing on the wall about um, Southern Cheyennes being in Florida in the, you know, 1875. And I know enough about my people's history, Southern Cheyenne people, uh, that's who I come from, to know that we were not in Florida ever, or like, I never heard of that. Um, so there's this, so it was a rabbit hole um, that caused this part of the, the new book um, that has to do with the blueprint for boarding schools and for Carlisle 
specifically Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Um, Richard Henry Pratt had these prisoners um, at, a, at a prison castle. It was actually in St. Augustine, Florida, where the first um, the first European settlement in the United States, in the contiguous United States, that's where it was in, in St. Augustine. And uh, he, he used the experience of, of three years with, with these mostly like adult men, there was one woman, um, prisoners as a blueprint to then take children and, and do with what he saw as a successful uh, reforming of them into military figures with military uniforms, military training, do this to the kids was, was the idea of kill the Indian, save the man. Some people might be familiar with that. So my interest became like, like my people were like sort of the blueprint for this really devastating cultural genocide campaign that lasted decades and decades, even after Carlisle shut down in 1918, these same practices and ideas that, that being an Indian was, was wrong and that this, this other way of living was superior and, you know, Christianity and, and um, the white way, the Washington way, as it was sometimes called, uh, was the superior way of being a human. Um, I became really interested in that. So the new novel, uh, you find out sort of how the people in history are related to the people from there, there, because um, Opal has a, a grandmother who she ends up finding this, all this writing that she had done to, you know, uh, that sort of writing about this time period. Because um, her dad was one of the people that was at the at Fort Marion, and she, uh, Opal's grandmother from there, there, who, whose name was also Opal, which is referenced in there, there, um, was at Carlisle for, for a time. Thank you so much. I think um, we've we've entered the more public part of the of the evening. And we invite questions from folks who are visiting us from all over Turtle Island, we learned. Um, and Tommy will, will answer those questions or engage with you. So, um, so we please, should, please, sorry, Michael. Yes. We should, we should definitely have them put the questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah. So if you'll put your questions in the chat, some of the students from our class might want to re revisit some of the questions that they had that did, they didn't get to ask. Tommy, and of course, some of our guests here will have questions. So um, I'm just looking through the chat and I see there's been some discussion that people going back and forth. So please feel <clears throat> free to drop your questions in the chat box. People are excited about your new book. <clears throat> um, Amy, do you want to? Sure, yeah. And Tommy, feel free to, if you want to, take a look at the chat. There's something that's really exciting for you. Um, we can pull it out. Special shout out to Jenny Davidson for, for the note on sequels. I appreciate that. <laughs> Linda from Los Alamos wants to know, do you write poetry? Um, uh, I feel really wrong saying that I do. I got, I had a poem published uh, during the pandemic that was like a pandemic collection. Um, and um, I love poetry and, and all that it is. Um, and I think some of my initial instincts toward writing were poetry driven, but um, I, currently, I, I, I'm not like actively doing it. I, I'm, I'm sure one day I'll, I'll get deeper into it. But I feel very like very much like a novice when it comes to poetry and understanding it. And, and just in the past couple of years have like been wanting to understand it more. Whereas I felt like before it was keeping its mystery from me. And like, but um, I've just felt more recently that like I, um, I accept its mystery and I, and I hope one day to get more deeply involved with it. Siren Echo Zivalich um, wants to know why you made the decision to have Jackie go on the road trip to Oakland with Harvey, despite the trauma and harm he had caused. Um, she says when she read that the first time or when, I'm not sure about the pronouns, um, they slammed the book closed and paced back and forth in confusion. 
and still wants to know? Well, I think, you know, getting back to Oakland um, and really wanting to end this cycle of addiction and not being connected to her grandsons and being in this conference where sort of sent her into this emotional state where then she gets a message from Opal and is really thinking about her grandsons and as well as she's reminded of her daughter's death. Um, she's in this state where she happens to see somebody who's going to Oakland and, uh, you know, obviously um, this guy's awful and um, I was not trying to make him be okay or even sympathetic but just that this opportunity presented itself in her life and in, in the timing of it um, made sense to her to get back to Oakland in a way that, you know, was immediate. And um, so that's the only way I can explain it. I'm not going to defend Harvey or what happened or um, I, I'm sorry that 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 part um, bothered you. I mean, it, it was supposed to be an uncomfortable situation. It was an awful thing that happened. Yeah, I remember the part where she says, like, he shouldn't, he should feel uncomfortable um, that Harvey should. Um, Shannon Farrell wants to know how much your work with Story Center influenced your use of pivoting perspectives, um, if at all. I don't think, I don't think that my work with Story Center was a part of that. I think I was always fascinated with the POV and what, what it could do in fiction. Um, I, I'm really fascinated with pronouns and with the angle of what POV and tense can do on, on the perch of the, the narrator and what that gives to the reader and how that interacts with the reader's imagination and with the writer's imagination. Um, and this is all stuff that I you know, learned from reading and, and just informed by stuff that I loved reading. So, you know, Story Center and my work with Story Center and my work doing other storytelling stuff on my own and with, with the Native American Health Center uh, had a lot of other influences, but not, not really the POV thing, I wouldn't say at all. I'm gonna use my facilitator's prerogative and ask a follow-up question that just is really nagging at me. Um, you said earlier two things about the story collecting storytelling work that you were doing um, that you would never use people's own stories in fiction. I just would love you hear, love to hear you say more about why that is. Yeah, I think I think at one point, you know, I, while I was doing storytelling work, um, I, I worked with people that had these amazing stories, and I and I knew I wanted to work on a novel. And, and these three day experiences that I had with people were so emotional and heavy and people really like what ended up in with their short films um, was like a, the iceberg tip for like a lot of stuff that they had gone through. Um, and so the idea of, of using and even like the language for it um, using their their experience um it just it, it it didn't feel right even though i had some you know i think there was some part of me initially like oh this is what writers do they like you know they they mine people's experiences for stories and then they use them and i think there is some element of that that's still in the the idea of what stories should be and, and the way that we should think about other people's stories um but ultimately, you know, having worked with people and, and, and seeing them go through like, oh, in order to get this detail about your life, you had to go through like this, 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 and this, and you had to feel this, 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 and this. And so the idea that I would like cherry pick a detail from somebody's lived experience, just, it, it just didn't sit right with me in any way. So I, I picked generously from my life inside and out and my family's life to some extent in one chapter specifically that my family has referred to as our chapter um, with their permission. Um, 
but otherwise really, you know, tried to do the, where the imaginative work was that was influenced by, you know, stuff that felt real. There's a, a somewhat related question in the chat. Um, Maz says, hey, Tommy, thank you so much for this enlightening talk. I was wondering how you deal with the concept of originality, this literary urge to constantly see something new and daring. Do you think that idea is in contention with heritage? Which to me relates to the question of sort of where stories come from. I mean, I, I really like contemporary novels and playing with form. Um, I think there's an unhealthy obsession with with new and originality and and uh, but I uh, but I also think the the authenticity game and the way it leans too heavily on uh, the past and and on things that are only relegated to history um, is also a false way of thinking about tradition and heritage because part of what made our ancestors as native people, what made us strong is adaptation over time. Like I am, belong to the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma, but within that I'm Southern Cheyenne, which is different from Northern Cheyenne. They're in, they're in Montana that has its own story. And even within Southern Cheyenne people, there's Sistas and there's Sutais, and I belong to the Sutai people. And there were tribes before that that don't exist anymore. And this is a story of adaptation and change and, and newness. And sometimes when it comes to who's authentic, and this goes back to what Audra and I were, had been referencing earlier about this, like the target being aimed at this authentic headdressed native to only put us, pit us against this historical image. Um, and the idea of authentic only ever being in history is super damaging and and wrong and, and a, a false way of thinking about what the strength of tradition is and what the strength of native people is and adaptation uh, is a huge part of what we are. Thank you, that's a, that's a great answer. Um, I have a, a private anonymous message in the chat from someone who worries they don't know enough about the publishing world to ask this question, but I think it's a really good one. Um, they're wondering about how publishers reacted to their there. What was the process of trying to get the book published? Were they excited about the potential? Um, uh, the question, the thinking behind the question is from hearing about how other writers writing about marginalized identities and communities critique the publishing industry for only wanting specific stories. I think. Had I tried to, you know, had had I even gotten the the book in front of publishers' eyes five years before, maybe maybe that's even a ludicrous idea that it would even have been in front of eyes um, five years earlier. They're there, and its attention is completely tied to its timeline, um, and so I think it's you know super valid that a lot of people have have that get pushback from publishers and and feel compromised or have to like push against being compromised for their vision and representing their people for for a truth as opposed to like a trope that they that might be wanted because this has already been proven to sell and that's like the publishing industry why it's an industry um, and not just like a pure art cheerleader squad or that's probably not the right way to say it but you know it's not purely like just trying to have good art exist in the world it's it's an industry but for there, there, uh, it. I got an agent five days after Trump was elected. Um, I was at a workshop, at Tomales Bay Writing by Writers workshop, where I was a fellow and I did a seven minute reading. And an author heard me read uh, from there, there, from the manuscript at the time. And um, this was like October 2016. And she was like, give me your whole manuscript. I want to send it to my agent. And then nothing really happened. Uh, and something similar had happened before that and sort of a nothing panned out kind of thing. Three days after Trump was elected, uh, actually the day after Trump was elected, both that writer and another one was like, um, took it as a call to action. So sent my manuscript out. Um, 
and Standing Rock was going on at the same time. So in people's consciousness was, you know, Native people were on TV for this awful thing that was happening. And so pe people were aware of it. It was, you know, we we're never on TV for that long. We got, we just got Native TV shows, as was mentioned earlier, but like, we're not, we don't make news normally. And we were making news consistently with, with Standing Rock. And so my agent, my now agent was up at three in the morning with anxiety about Trump getting elected. And she read my manuscript and she specifically was moved by the prologue, which is speaking against, you know, this idea of making America great again and everything that 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 movement is trying to return to. Um, the prologue to her, I think, was like speaking against that. And the time period was the book was representing something that made sense for people to get on board with. So, you know, I sold the book a month after Trump was inaugurated and all of it exists in a context. And like I said, five years before that, I don't know how much people would have cared 10 years before. I'm not sure. Um, so uh, by the, all of this is to say by the time it got sold and, it, you know, like it went to auction and um, I ended up at Knopf, which, you know, I didn't know anything about Knopf before that, but now I know that, you know, Tony Morrison was at Knopf for all career. Um, they were, my editor's great and they were great and I didn't have to compromise anything, but that is because it existed within this, like, we need to do this thing against uh, the onslaught, the oncoming, of, you know, these barking clowns. This is this is where I'll, I'll I'll pause thinking about Trump and Standing Rock and violating treaties to profit off Native people to insert my it's a feature not a bug comment once again. There's a couple of related questions in the chat. Um, one asks, uh, how do you emotionally cope with the long lasting violence toward Indigenous people in the United States? And then a follow up. Um, also wondering how you take care of yourself when sharing and writing these stories of erasure and violence. Do you build in self-care strategies when you're writing? I think, um, you know, some people take the, the information and the content and the, the content of the lives of the people in the book is heavy. Um, and, I, and I, you know, I've gotten questions like, why did you write something so sad? Like, this is like a, actually like a repeated question when I was on book tour. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's somebody in, in Copenhagen actually asked, why did you write about such miserable lives? And, you know, I took pretty deep offense to like, well, these are like, this is what I, this is like my content of my life. And I don't think of myself as sad or miserable. And I don't think of it as heavy, you know, specifically. Um, I think there's definitely a lot as a native person that you're interfacing with, um, but it's also somewhat normalized and it's not heavy if that's all that it's ever been. Um, I also, in the writing process and, in you know, turning um, some of these experiences and some of these thoughts and feelings into an art form and working on the art form through the revision process to try to you know, do what I can to do it to make it communicable and, and beautiful wherever I can is transformative and it's moving energy. It's not, I'm not digging into energy in order to sit in it and be stuck in it. It's, it's a moving of energy. Um, and so because I feel it's a transformative experience, uh, I have self-care things that I do, like I run, um, and it's questionable because I, you know, I do long distance running. It's questionable that that's self-care and not some kind of punishment. Um, but, you know, I, I have things that I do that are toward, you know, taking care of myself and I'm getting better at it. And I have been getting better at it and, and have been cultivating self-worth toward betterment at it because I've, you know, I have destructive tendencies. And, um, but, the, but the work and the, and the thinking about the work and the lives of, of the people that I am writing about, that isn't something that drags me down or keeps me, you know, that is, some, that is something that works with the energy and, and, and lifts it, or at least like moves it. 
Thank you. And there was a question in the chat, um, Michael asking about a feature, not a bug. And just to add to the response, Elizabeth, you know, the, or Michael, do you want to explain what it means in the context of uh, Native American history? Sure. Uh, you know, actually, I just finished a book. Uh, and as I was finishing the book, Ferguson was happening at the same time that Standing Rock was happening. And this book was about essentially the treaty process and how the United States is created uh, by virtue of having trees that coercively force Native people to cede title to land that could then be turned into public domain, that could then be sold to private property to white settlers at the same time simultaneously using black labor, but also excluding free black settlers by a series of black laws from settling these same new territories and, and over policing black bodies in that sense. And so at the time I'm writing all this stuff and this feature about how this is integral to America, I'm seeing it on screen as Tommy was talking about, Ferguson is erupting, Standing Rock is erupting. And I guess the point of which is thinking about all these histories, um, if we keep being presented with these moments of violence as if they are one-offs or anomalies, when in fact they're not, this is the structure of the system. Um, and to see this as a structural problem rather than a one-off or an anomaly is super important to figure out how we can put an end to these sorts of things or how we can cope with the, the the loss and the suffering that people have been asking Tommy how he how he copes with this, these sorts of uh, hard stories and one way we do that is by recognizing that this is part of the structure and if we're going to change change the, that we need to change the structure. There's a question in the chat that relates to that actually from Beatrice, uh, who says, "I love the novel tells I love that the, this novel tells the story of how all of these characters manage their identities in this country." challenges the urge Americans have to gather minority groups under a monolithic experience. Thank you. What do you think the future of the Native American experience looks like? Do you see anything in this country which suggests that we might begin to truly reckon with this history? I mean, you know, you want to hope and you want to look at something like reservation dogs in Rutherford Falls as, you know, important toward like narrative acknowledgement um you know it, it it sometimes hurts me to say the phrase like we're still here because it's like it's so tired if you're a native person you, people have been saying that for so long even the saying of it feels like ugh. but um but it, but the general population isn't there isn't tired of the idea that we're still here we're there's people i got a haircut before my best friend's wedding a few years back and the barber who cut my hair was, you know, very much in this, you're still here question. And then once she realized that I was one of the people still here, the next two questions were about, oh, but you got free education and you get a, you know, a check every month. Um, so this idea that there's like some like invisible reparations, if we are still here, then like we've taken care of it. Um, uh, you know, so you want to have hope, but uh, we're so divided, you know, this country is so divided on this attack on critical race theory is so stupid. Like most of the people that are attacking me don't even understand what it is um, and uh, or where it's taught. And, and the meanwhile, the, the just public schools as institutions are still teaching really harmful versions of American history and really like, you know, sanitizing or just straight up propaganda for this country being the greatest thing ever. And, uh, you know, Trump, when he was in office, threatening to do some kind of patriotic education thing as if that wasn't already in place. It's really hard to have hope that, like, you know, meeting with colleges and, and, and what colleges are doing is super hopeful and, and the future is hopeful to think about. But uh, I am afraid for 2024 and, you know, a big portion of this country um, not wanting to revise what this country means. And so much of that has to do with our stories and our experiences being seen, being witnessed and being, um, you know, integrated into the way we think of ourselves as Americans. Um, I know we're starting to run a little bit low on time. I remember you said at the beginning that you hadn't done a, a focused event like this about the role of storytelling and digital storytelling and the, the roots of this project. I'm wondering if there's anything that you 
had in mind that you wanted to share about that that hasn't come up through the questions that we've asked you? I mean, I think, I think I maybe didn't realize until this, until today and, and meeting with you all, um, how much the novel grew out of meeting with people in, in, in the way that people who are doing oral storytelling work and collecting stories and the trying to get the, at the heart of, of where story lives in people and listening and the nature of listening and understanding how tied in with history, um, personal story and personal narrative and, and how important listening is. And I think, you know, I think that's just something that really informed me as a writer before I even started writing this book. And I don't think I fully like really understood that until, uh, until this group today. So thank you. Thank you all for doing this and for, and for, uh, you know, inspiring that to come to me. That's really lovely. Um, there's a follow-up question in the chat actually that's related from Dow, who I think is Dow from Voice of Witness. Um, so do you think there's an ethical way to share, do you think there is an ethical way to share stories that have been gathered orally? Perhaps in a process of co-creation with narrators when both when interviewers are from the narrator communities and maybe also when not, thinking especially about whether Dean was constrained by thinking about oral history in its less evolved formats that are extractive or from outsiders. I definitely think there's a way to do it. Um, and I was like, you know, I was doing the work in a way that didn't feel compromised because the whole idea was that you're helping people, you're helping to teach people how to tell their own stories and then having them work with the editing software to do it themselves. But outside of that, I think having people from within communities gathering the stories is all the difference. I think the outsider gaze when it comes to collecting stories and like, some of the language around the way we talk about capturing and you know the history of film is is fraught with these violent words for how we recapture and we shoot footage like you know there's there's all this like really violent uh, way that we think of of um, gathering stories and and cultivating stories would be better words but we don't you know we haven't really updated it so i think you know having people from within communities automatically does a lot of work because you're not going to have the outsider gaze that has to do with collecting for a purpose which usually is ego driven or money driven seeing some kind of like motivation for where this could sell or who would be interested in this or like museum people or historic history people that aren't from within the community or don't have the community's interest in mind at the outset what they're doing is like a taking as opposed to people that are invested in the community, their their purpose is to cultivate what's already there. The oral historians here are going crazy about the idea of cultivating stories. I really like that too. Um, <clears throat> there was a question a while back asking about um, some of the native organizations in Oakland that you like and have referred to if folks maybe want to support. Is there anyone you want to shout out? And then Carlin, can you put the links back in the chat for um, ways folks can support Lenape um, organizing and also the students who are on strike? Yeah, definitely. Um, the American Indian Child Resource Center in Oakland is always doing great work and they can always use help and the Intertribal Friendship House in Oakland. Um, I think if you Google Intertribal Friendship House Oakland, you're gonna come up with something called like urbanres.com or something. Um, but uh, both of those places, um, they always can use help and they're always doing great work year round. Um, yeah, IFH Urban Res. Um, so if you wanna help out, Native people in Oakland, those, those two places with elders and with young people, a lot of focus on those two groups, which are really important. Audra and Michael, did you want to say anything to close us out? Uh, I'll just say thank you, Tommy. Um, deeply appreciative uh, that you spent so much time with us. Um, really grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It's great to, to spend some time with you again. Uh, I appreciate you.
Yeah, thank you all so much. And thank you to our audience for, for sharing your thoughts and your responses and your, your questions. Um, Tommy, you're absolutely blanketed in our love and attention. And th there was a question about when the new book is coming out, but if you want to share, I don't think you even need to tell us because we'll all just be waiting and super excited to read it and find out what happens to these characters. I would be happy to tell you, but I don't know. I, it depends <laughs> on whether my editor uh, likes it or not. Yeah. So. As, as a person who works in academia, I know you can't ask people when they're finishing their dissertation either. So <laughs> I didn't ask that one when it first came up. Um, and I'll send you a I'll send you a text copy of the chat when we're done so that you can see all of the um, appreciation and, and love that's been flowing through there that you probably haven't had a chance to to look at. Um, thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you again to all of our co-sponsors that made this possible. Um, Good night to folks on the East Coast and enjoy your evening to folks on the West Coast. <laughs>